الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد uh, I'm going to be talking about da'wa and I wanted to give you a quick introduction of this seminar so I, I taught for several years in an Islamic school uh, actually 12 to 13 years to be more exact and uh, part of that you know in the high school curriculum I, I kind of created this Da'wah seminar and it was an actually a, a whole semester long class that I would teach and um, it, it would be like four days a week pretty much so it's an entire semester worth of material I'm not teaching that of course today that's not possible but I, I just took a few slides from that and inshallah I hope to share that with you today and to give you a quick um, introduction about myself Alhamdulillah I have a bachelor's in computer science uh, from Wayne State University that was way back in like 2004. I worked as a web administrator like IT professional for some years um, and then Alhamdulillah I started to study Islam and I started studying with Islamic University of America which was in Michigan at that time um, and then other local scholars in Michigan uh, and I became more and more interested in teaching the deen well learning first and then teaching the deen as well so I started pursuing a bachelor's in Islamic studies and I started teaching full time as well. So Alhamdulillah um, from 2004 or five uh, till last year pretty much I, I was teaching. Um, I, I have a bachelor's in Islamic studies from Mishkat University. How many of you guys have heard of that before? Oh, some of you. Um, and I also am a Shura member uh, for the local Y Islam team. How many of you guys have heard of Y Islam? Have you guys seen the billboards and different things? Okay, cool. So, um, Waisam Ashura, I currently work for, with Helping Hand for Relief and Development. It's a, it's a really rewarding opportunity. I was actually working with the state of California as well uh, previously and, you know, working in a cubicle. Some people have that and they just, you know, they enjoy that. But I really like getting out in the field, meeting with the Muslims and other people as well. So, Alhamdulillah, I have had that experience. And I also do this, um, it's kind of on the side, it's uh, Islam, uh, ilmscape.org. It's like a camping thing for young Muslims. And so we're actually going to be going on April 11th, inshallah, next month. We'll be taking a group down to Coloma and uh, doing different activities. So that's a little bit about me. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and start actually with the seminar. So what happened? Okay. So there was um, a Saudi man. And he, like many young men or women, he wanted to give da'wah. And so one of the things that he did is he started to um, try to think of different ways or opportunities of what he could do. And the problem that he had was that he was mute. He couldn't speak. And so that becomes extremely challenging, right? Because when you hear the word da'wah, what do you think of? What I'm kind of doing, right? Speaking. Or you think of what Imam Ammar does. He gives khutbah or uh, different halaqat and these types of things. Or you think of different people standing behind a booth and giving the message of Islam to people. So he wasn't going to be able to do this. He's mute. And so he was thinking about it and he came to this conclusion that he was going to start by giving tapes. At that time, this was in the 90s, okay? So that doesn't even exist anymore, right? Um, but so he was giving tapes. He would record different Islamic lectures and he would go and give them to different Muslims. Okay, so he's in Saudi Arabia. Primarily he's giving da'wah or doing islah, um, a reformation of the Muslim audience. And so what he did is he started to go out and whenever he went to a marketplace, he would give them a tape. Whenever he met someone anywhere, he would be just giving them different tapes. He did this for a few months and you could imagine, you know, maybe a few hundred, five, six hundred tapes later, there, there's quite a bit of people you've get, he's given da'wah to. So one day he walks into a market and the guy behind the counter, he's just excited to see him and he starts hugging him and, he's, and the, the guy, he didn't understand exactly why he was so excited. And so he asked him, or he didn't ask him, but he kind of like, you know, you're not recognizing me, so I'll tell you what the story is. And so he says to him, he says, well, a few months ago, you came into my store, you gave me a tape, and I didn't really think much of it at that time, but then I, I, I listened to it. And after listening to it, I started to cry. I started to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And I decided that I need to do something with this. And so he went home. He had six roommates living with him. And so he t basically turned off the TV. He had everyone listen to the tape. They all cried and they became, or you could say they reformed themselves. They made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to come closer to him. And they actually decided to come closer by uh, coming to the masjid or going to the masjid more and more often as well. So one of the things that we see a lot of times is people making excuses, right? A lot of these different common excuses come up, like I'll lose my friends. And so I, what I would like you to do right now is kind of an activity with me. And so I'll lose my friends, I don't have time, I'm not a good Muslim myself, I don't have enough knowledge. These are some common excuses that a lot of people give not to give da'wah, right? So what are some possible responses to these? So give me one. How about I'll lose my friends? Anyone? That's a good excuse for that, yeah. Or a response to that, yes. Yeah, so if you're, you're going to lose those friends, it might be better that you lose them because they might not be the best friends. They might have not been a positive influence for you in the first place. So that might be better for you, right? What else? What can happen if you lose those friends and you start gaining new friends? Right? So you start gaining new friends who might be going to the masjid, who might be giving that well, who might be you know, doing different things that are mo going to motivate you to be better as well. And so this, that's one. What about I don't have time? This was a common one, right? Everyone uses this, especially us here in the West. We use this one a lot. I don't have time. I'm so busy. I go to work, my comm commute's one hour, and then an hour in, on the way back, and then, you know, all these different things, and then I have to go to the masjid, or my kids, and so what, what's an excuse for, or what's a response for that one? Yeah. Okay, so prioritize, right? You have to make time for those things, especially things that you really think uh, are important. And uh, um, anyone want to take a guess of how many hours a week we actually, as Americans, on average, have of free time? Yeah. 56. 56? Is that the new number? Okay. Uh, well, is that a guess? I've calculated an average of the universe of okay. students that I've talked to. So. Okay. Okay. MashaAllah. 56. Any other numbers? I looked at a study and average Americans, they said about 44.2 hours or something like that. So about 44 hours a week, we as Americans, we have a free time. And usually what are we doing with that free time? Wasting it, Wasting it with these, right? Our phone, phones, apps, all these different things. Actually, we were having a discussion on the way here and we were talking about how the screen time, if you look at it, it's like six, seven hours. I mean, just think about it. You were looking six, seven hours at this device, wasting our time. And so one of the things I started doing, especially with WhatsApp, I just paused it. Because it's just, it's crazy. You're just constantly getting bombarded and added to groups all the time. And so it just, it's, it's just becomes non, uh, nonsense and you can't keep up with all these things. So we actually do have time. We need to prioritize that time. We need to stop wasting that time. What about, I'm not a good Muslim myself. That's another thing. A lot of people, they, they oh, I'm not a good Muslim. I, I don't feel comfortable enough to give that one. Any ideas, brothers? Yeah. I mean, uh, you can't really see a good Muslim. Uh, the only observable quote unquote trait that you can see for a good Muslim is them praying, but other than that, you can't really. It's all kind of. Okay, so th that's a really good point. First of all, we're, none of us are perfect Muslims. None of us can claim that. Only the Prophet Sallallahu was sinless, uh, sinless pretty much, right? So he didn't have any sins at all. Other than him, even the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, right? They had, you know, mistakes that they made. The best of us nowadays, they still make mistakes, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in a hadith as well that Kullu uh, Bani Adam khata'a. Right, every son of Adam makes mistakes, makes errors, and the khayru uh, the khayru al khata ain min al tawabin are the ones who make tawbah to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and so making tawbah to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and coming back to Him and continuously making this journey and going back to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, this is a, a part of a, a Muslim's you could say journey, and we need to all improve ourselves. Okay, so. As soon as you start thinking that I'm the best Muslim and I can start giving da'wah 
and you think that you're maybe better than other people, that's kind of a warning sign that shaitan has you, right? So that's actually a negative thing. So we should always have that. We should have hope, of course. Remember, the believer is between hope and fear, a raja and khawf. And so um, a believer, he, he is hopeful that the deeds are being accepted, but he's also fearful that maybe the sins or maybe the mistakes are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might hold him account for that or her uh, accountable for those things. And so those are things that we should be always looking at and thinking about that uh, I could become a better Muslim, but again, it's never going to be per a per perfect situation. What about I don't have enough knowledge? That's a really, really common one as well. What's a good response to that one? You'll learn on the job, actually you will, right? How many teachers, how many people have you, um, or your professors told you that one of the best ways to learn is to teach? How many of you guys have heard of that before, right? And so when you tutor someone, when you talk to someone and you try to explain some type of math you know, equation or whatever to them, or some scientific, whatever you're learning, when you're explaining it, you're learning it actually, or you're solidifying it in your own head, first. And so I don't have enough knowledge is really not an excuse, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he actually mentions in one hadith, بَلِّهُ أَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً that pro, uh, like propagate from me even if it's one ayah. So everyone, how many of us know Surah Al-Fatiha? Alhamdulillah. Some people are like, I don't know, I don't know, maybe I don't. Well, yeah, of course you know it, mashallah. Right? So we know Surah Al-Fatiha, we know Surah Al-Ikhlas, we know some basic tenets of Islam, we know the basic principles, Alhamdulillah, most of us pro were probably born Muslims, and so we have a basic understanding of what Islam teaches. So that's not really an excuse, we can use that to teach someone else about Islam, okay? Whatever a limited amount of knowledge that we have, and that's also a good trait too, that we're humbling ourselves, we're not thinking that we're scholars or you know, extremely knowledgeable about our religion and that we don't want to share it with anyone else um, until I have enough knowledge. Uh, one caveat though I want to mention is that sometimes um, it, we should be extremely careful of what types of topics we're talking about and stay within our realm, right? So because sometimes, unfortunately, um, if we do not have knowledge of cer certain topics or, you know, uh, fiqh issues and some people start talking about those, then we, we need to be staying clear from those because we might be held accountable for the uh, for giving the wrong information as well. Okay, what do you think this guy's doing? Delivering mail? Okay. Is he in a hurry? Oh, yeah, he seems like he's in a hurry, right? Maybe not the guy over there who's scared of the coronaviruses. <laughs> Oh, mashallah. Maybe I should get a mask too. But I, uh, are there any cases in, in Davis or there were? Wow. Oh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you shifa, inshallah. Kamila wa ajila. So um, this, this person is delivering the mail pretty much, right? And uh, what does the mailman do? They deliver mail, but what are they really doing? They're, they're acting as what? What? Middlemen, right? They're taking a message from someone, okay? And delivering it to someone else. And it could be extremely important things and items and so on. And so this is actually a, a, a certain scenario that happened in, I believe it was Virginia or Washington DC. So um, there was this guy, a mailman, he was pretty, I guess, smart guy, right? So what he does is he, he decides that, you know, it's too much uh, of a hassle of going door to door or delivering mail. So he started to get the mail that he got or whatever in the morning and he would go dump it somewhere. And he did this for a few days and then what do you think is going to start happening? People are going to probably start complaining, right? So you start missing some payments or bills that were supposed to come in, a check that was supposed to come in. You start missing out on some of these things and of course people are going to become really curious to what's happening to their mail. So eventually they found out that this guy he, he was doing it for several weeks until they found out. And so he was just dumping their mail away. Okay, what do you think happened to him? Fired and imprisoned, actually. It's a federal offense to tamper with people's mail. Okay, and so this person still, uh, served jail time because of what he did. And so one of the things is that as um, the middle ummah, you could say, and the scholars, they explain it in different ways, 
the ayah from uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 143, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَسَطَى لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions like an example of like this ummah, right? Ummatun wasata, or ummatan wasata. And so this middle ummah, and this middle ummah is after Bani Israel, and what's after us? Is there going to be any ummah after us? The day of judgment, right? And that's why we're called the middle ummah, or actually one of the reasons why the scholars say the, the, we're the middle ummah. And so because we're this middle ummah, it's our responsibility to take this message and give it to other and propagate it to the people around us. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the previous prophets, when they came with their risala, their message, who did they have to deliver it to? Any ideas? To who? Their people, okay? So their qawm, their nation. So Musa Alaihi Salam to the Bani Israel, right? Yusuf alayhi salam, I mean all the different prophets. They delivered the message to their people specifically. Now the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his duty was to give this message to all people, to all mankind. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a mercy to the entire mankind. To not just the humans, but even the animals and other you know, creatures on this earth. And so one of the responsibilities of a Muslim after the Prophet ﷺ passed away was to deliver this message. To deliver this, you know, these, the, the, the basics of our, our faith to those who don't know. Now what do you think would have happened if the Sahaba didn't share the message? Would we be Muslim today? Probably not, right? How many of us are from Southeast Asia? Like Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, a lot of us, okay? How about um, like, you know, the Middle East? Okay, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, right? So different places in the world that we're, part of, we're from. If the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or his Sahaba didn't really reach out and go out and try to deliver the message, we wouldn't be Muslim today, right? Islam probably would have ended within that generation as well. And so because of their sacrifices and their dedication to this deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread the message and this is one of our responsibilities as well today that we need to go and spread this da'wah and give it to other people as well. Now if we don't do it, then we will be held accountable just like this mailman. Well, this is probably not him really exactly, but we would be, you know what I mean, right? So we're going to be held responsible on the day of judgment. Maybe our neighbor, maybe our classmate, maybe other people around us will ask us on the day of judgment or complain about us really, that this person was my classmate, my roommate, my neighbor, whatever, for this many years, months, or whatever it was, and he never or she never told me about Islam. Or maybe they never really practiced Islam in front of me where I would have been, you know, kind of motivated or encouraged to even find out more about Islam. Maybe they discouraged me from becoming Muslim. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Now, what is your dream job? How many of you guys are seniors right now in, college, uh, in UC Davis? Um, one, two, okay, Michelle. So some of you guys are seniors. What do you guys plan on doing? What's your dream? Like if, if you had any job in the world, what would you do? Sports what is that? Sports, Sports commentator, okay. Doctor. What is that? Doctor. A doctor, okay. Are you in med school or going to med school, Michelle? Planning on it, inshallah. Hopefully you, you become successful in that, inshallah. All right, so you want to become a doctor. Anyone else? So we have all these different, some of you like, I'm lost. I'm a freshman, sophomore. I took a bunch of bio classes. I'm not doing so well. I need to go into computer science, right? So that was our fallback when I was in college. So um, everyone, everyone, especially Desis, our parents want us to become doctors, right? And then when you don't do that and you're the failure of the family, and then, so then you go to computer science. But anyways, so, uh, but the, everyone has this dream job in this, this kind of like, you know, motivation on what they want to do in life, right? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in this ayah, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُبَّنْتٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us basically what our name card or name tag or best job in the world would be. And what that is, is that we are the best ummah. We are not beca- the best ummah because we want to be, I mean, no, not dissing, trying to diss doctors or engineers or anything like that, but, or anyone or any profession. But we are not going to be the best ummah because of those professions. The, be- the reason why we're the best ummah is because we are uh, raised for mankind uh, in its entirety, is that we enjoin the good and we forbid the evil. And we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of this, this is why we're the best. Now this doesn't mean that you have to give up your job and go become an imam or a sheikha somewhere or something like that and go live in you know, Yemen for eight years and studying Islam or something like that, right? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that in whatever responsibility you have in life, okay? Um, you're, you're working, uh, you need to be the best role model possible that you're propagating Islam in one way or another, inshallah, through your actions and words as well, um, to people who are around you, inshallah, and trying to motivate them. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. What is this picture of? Anyone recognize that? It was probably one of the most horrific, yeah. The Titanic sinking, right? Everyone watched the movie probably, right? So the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he actually mentions it. And Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhu, he mentions that the example of the people abiding by Allah's orders and the limits and the ones who do wrong and violate Allah's orders and limits are like the example of people drawing lots for, a seat, uh, for seats in a boat. Some people, they're given or they go to the lower level of the boat and some people are put in the higher level of the boat. The people in the lower level, whenever they need water or anything, they have to go all the way upstairs, get water, come all the way back, and so it's, it's burdensome. And so one of the people in the bottom, the Prophet Wasallam mentions this in the hadith, that he gets an axe and he decides that it's too much trouble going up there, I'm bothering those people above me, I'm just going to make a hole in this bo- bottom of the boat and get the water myself. Now if the people from the top don't do anything about it, or anyone who's sitting there doesn't do anything about it, what's going to happen? That's going to happen, right? That's going to happen. Pretty much the entire boat's going to sink or the, sh- uh, the ship will sink. Everyone's going to be destroyed. And so this example is the one also we can take from this is the people who practice the deen, they need to not think that they're better than anyone else, like the ones who might not be practicing. Like if you're praying five times a day, it doesn't mean that you're better than the person who is not praying five times a day. However, it means that the people who um, are trying to practice and trying to do good deeds, they need to be reaching out and trying to call the other people to good as well, to khair, right? To enjoy the good and forbid the evil from, the, from people doing evil things or actions that are going to jeopardize the entire ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so this is something that we have to be extremely um, uh, uh, careful about that and, and, and looking at, because a lot of times, what do we hear a lot? We say, well, it's not my business, right? Or what, what's the common term nowadays that a lot of people use? What is that? Can't think of it myself right now, so I'm just trying to get ideas. So uh, it, basically, like, it's not my business, or, you know, uh, let them do what they want. You know, it's not, yeah. Yeah, I'm not here to judge anyone, right? Or don't judge me. So all these, you, you tell them, oh, you know, let's go to the masjid, let's pray. Like, don't judge me. Well, I'm not judging you. I'm just inviting you to the masjid, right? So a lot of times we're quick to tell people, you know, that this is something that we're doing or maybe that we find offense to it when someone tries to actually tell us something good or reasonable to do. And so we need to really reflect on that. If someone is, I mean, we have to, of course, advise each other. And deenu nasiha, and nasiha is supposed to be done in a very beautiful manner, in a good manner, right? And so we need to use the, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and see how he invited the people and try to do that in the best way possible uh, before people, you could say, ruin themselves in this dunya as well as the akhirah. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as I was just mentioning, following his sunnah, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا 
right? Indeed, in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you'll find the best example. And so we need to go to his seerah and to the different stories of how he would approach people in da'wah and what he would do, inshallah, and try to follow those methods and that methodology. And again, this is um, a very short version of the, the entire class. Maybe some other time I could go into more details, inshallah, and some ingredients of a da'i or uh, do's and don'ts and so on, and from more from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But here I'm just going to try to inshallah motivate you a little bit about why we should be giving da'wah. And then I'm going to give um, a few practical things at the end of how to start up a conversation and also what we could say if we're trying to give da'wah. Now this um, uh, ayah of the Quran, Surah Fussilat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He says, and it's a rhetorical question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, that who can be better than the one who invites, well, قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ that he invites to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا and he does righteous actions himself, himself. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ and he says that I am amongst the Muslims. And so who can be better than this type of person or this person? So not only, because a lot of people, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect myself and all of us inshallah from being, being of these people, sometimes we're self-righteous individuals. Sometimes we think we're better than everyone else and that's why I'm calling people and that's, you know, I'm better than them and that's why I need to call them. Or, and then a lot of times we forget the amal ourselves. We start reminding other people about things and we forget those things, right? Um, you know, alhamdulillah, I get the opportunity to give khutbah almost every week. And I start really thinking about it because after some weeks, months, you know, maybe a year and a half, two year passes, you have hundreds of different topics that you've spoken about. You have different, like I, I usually end the khutbah with like an action point or action items. And so I started thinking about like, what am I doing from this action, uh, these action items I'm suggesting, that am I doing any of these things myself? And so this is a thing that we need to question ourselves all the time. That w when I'm propagating the message of Islam, am I also practicing it myself? Because if you're doing that, inshallah, the message itself will be much, much more effective as well. Right? Because that means you're really convinced about this message, inshallah. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said to Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, Ya Ali, لِأَنَّ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرًا لَكَ مِمَّا تَعْلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ He said, Ya Ali radiallahu anhu, or O Ali, he says, if you are guided or one person is guided to, through you to Islam, that is better than whatever is under the sun. And then he says, وَخَيْرًا لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرِ النِّعَمِ and this is greater than red she camels. Remember, that was a commodity back then, right? A red she camel was like worth a lot of money back then. It was like the what is that? The the most expensive Tesla, the the SUV, I guess. It's one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty thousand dollars. So something like that, right? So and uh, other expensive cars. So back in the day, that's kind of what everyone was looking at. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, it's even better than that to guide one person to Islam. وَخَيْرًا لَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا And it is better than whatever is in the dunya uh, or in the dunya and whatever is in it. And so this is how important it is. And, and one of the things that, you know, a lot of times we, we look back in, you know, I'm almost like I'm in my 40s or I just be, uh, turned 40. And if, if I look back at how many years I really was calling people to Islam, Alhamdulillah, and doing different things for da'wah, I don't really have much to show for it, right? Maybe I have a few shahadas. And then you see other people, mashallah, they, they become Muslim and within maybe a week, two weeks of them becoming Muslim, they have tens, maybe hundreds of people who became Muslim. There's a prisoner right now in the Placer County Jail, okay? He became Muslim, this was I believe maybe six to eight months ago. He became, he became Muslim. Uh, he didn't, and remember that excuse that I don't have enough knowledge? So this probably has very limited knowledge. He learns maybe Surah Al Fatiha and a few other surahs. Starts calling people to Islam. About one of the brothers who was visiting him in jail, they said about 30 to 40 people now have become Muslim through this one brother. Okay? Within you know, a few months. And so there are some people, mashallah, they take the message, they're convinced about it, and they go and start sharing it with other people. And so are we really going to try to apply this hadith? And if we did, what would, we, uh, what would our actions be? What would that really mean to us? That if guiding one person 
is better than the dunya and whatever it contains, then what would we be doing to chase, I mean, not harass people to become Muslim, but what would we be doing to convince or help people become uh, Muslims? What would we be doing, right? What would we be doing if, and a lot of the scholars that give this, or the imams, they'll give this uh, uh, advice or the ex this example, but if, for example, you were paid, okay, you know, for coming to the masjid, or you were paid to give da'wah, or you were paid to do some type of righteous deed, how many of us would be signing up for that? And especially if it was like, for example, maybe for 15 minutes, we'd get paid like 50 bucks, right? Or if for, uh, you know, these little gigs that we have nowadays, you get a bunch of money for it. So a lot of us, were always chasing this. Why? Because it's easy money. And so the Prophet wasallam is telling us an easy way, you could say, to have whatever's in the dunya and and we don't really chase after that. That tells us something. It tells us that we are maybe not really convinced of the message of the Prophet ﷺ. It tells us that maybe we don't really believe in these words of the Prophet ﷺ. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and understanding inshaAllah. Now this, um, this is the infinity sign, right? And the reason why I put this up here is because the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he mentions He mentions that the one who guides to something that is good, that person gets the reward for it um, as if he was doing it. Okay, so for example, if inshallah one of you go, hopefully all of you, but go and start calling other people to Islam, inshallah ta'ala I will get the reward for it, even though I'm not doing it myself, right? So if a person calls one person, and that person called 10 people, it keeps going on and on. And we see this example of, you could say, tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this example. Who knows who this person is? What is that? Okay, Dr. Zakir Naik over here. And who's this? Yeah. Ahmad Didat, rahmatullah alayh. Okay. How many of you knew that Ahmad Didat was actually the teacher of Dr. Zakir? Oh, yeah, a few of you might know that. Okay, mashallah, right? There are so many different people, okay? How many of you guys know Sheikh Yasser Burjas? I've heard of him, right? Anyone know how he became or practicing or started practicing more? In one of his classes, one time he shared it. He said that he was, he was like 12, 13 years old. It was Ramadan and he was passing by, it was like Asr time. He was passing by the masjid and some, one of the younger guys he just, just randomly, he goes, hey, you know, why don't you come here? Are you busy? And he goes, no. He sat down in the halaqa and that's actually what motivated him to start studying Islam. And then now we know who he is, right? Sheikh uh, Abdullah Hakim Quick, anyone hear of him before? Okay. He became Muslim. We don't know the guy actually who even, a lot of the times we don't know who convinced them to become Muslim. And so this guy, he, um, some Pakistani, simple Pakistani guy, who didn't really have much knowledge or anything, went to him, somehow he, he converted. Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick helped Sheikh Bilal Phillips. Have you guys heard of him? Okay, so he converts to his son. Remember, he's the one who has, that, what is the IOU, International Open University or something like this. So he has thousands of students throughout the world. Thousands of people have accepted Islam through um, both of these brothers. Shoo. And so the person who, you know, the simple guy, we don't know his name, helped these people convert. And now he's just sitting back and relaxing, right? He's getting all this ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he was able to convince that this is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And you have like one after another, Imam Siraj Wahaj. Again, he was nation of Islam and how he converted. Or even Malcolm X, right? Rahmatullah alayhi. All these people who are like movers and shakers and really leaders of the Muslim world even. They might have had people who came to them, we don't know their names, we don't even really know how. How many of you guys, if you're from the subcontinent, you probably know Maulana Tariq Jameed. I've heard of him, right? He's an Urdu speaker. So he said that when he would play the guitar, he was becoming a medical or a doctor. Actually, he was, a, I think, second or third year med school student. And um, so the tablighis would come to him over and over again. And you guys know who they are, right? They randomly knock on your door, come onto the masjid and so on. So they are inviting him, he would turn up the music. And he would, he would pretty much play his guitar, he would, do, he would just 
not listening. And then one day he just said, you know, these guys keep coming to me. Let me at least listen to them. He listens to them. He decides that he wants to do something. So summer break came up. He went for, they go for 40 days a year. He went for 40 days of missionary work and so on. He gets convinced that he needs to do this. He quits med school. He goes and becomes an alim, basically a, 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 a scholar of Islam for eight to 10 years. He dedicates the rest of his life. He has thousands and thousands of uh, students across the world, maybe millions if you look now. And it's from a simple person who kept coming to his house to invite him to the masjid. So all of these different people getting the rewards because they kept, uh, stayed consistent. And so inshallah, hopefully we're motivated to that, uh, do that as well. So I want to do a, a few activities inshallah and then uh, end. I know it's getting late. And I was kind of surprised by Omar when he said 8 to 10. I was like, really? Seriously, 8 to 10? I'm already tired. But um, inshallah, we'll, we'll try to end it a little bit earlier. And I think the pizza is almost done. So you guys won't be probably uh, awake much longer with me, inshallah. So activity, what, uh, this is one of the, the toughest things to do is how to break the ice. Okay. So um, what I would like you to do is come up with um, and, and, and let's do this. The sisters over here, you guys are going to come up with a way to break the ice for the neighbors. The brothers over here for classmates. Um, sis, sisters over there, if you guys could get together and uh, how would you break the ice with strangers? And then the brother, that whole group in the back, if you guys could, could talk about coworkers. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a minute, inshallah. It could be your, if you're in a, dorm, a dormitory, then you're... Then we also categorize neighbors and people that we've known for a while. Neighbors, I'm, well, I, I know in our society, you don't, we don't really know our neighbors anymore. But yeah, like, so someone, someone, strangers are kind of a different category. Like, for example, you're sitting next to someone on, the pla on, the, on a plane, plane ride. That's a stranger, right? So a neighbor would be like, you literally live next to them or they're your roommate or something like that. Okay. So one minute, inshallah. Everyone kind of clear on that? So how would you come up or come up with an idea of how to break the ice with them? Go ahead, think about it. You have 45 seconds. You have 15 seconds. I see you can talk to them. Okay. Idea, sisters, let's start with you guys, the neighbors. How would you reach out to them? How would you break the ice with them? Okay. Excellent. Okay. You know, that kind of starts like, oh, who are these people? Or like, we really have the most exotic food, right? We have amazing food. And so when we share that with our neighbors, that just blows them away, right? It, they, they just love it. Like I have these um, uh, neighbors and they're extremely difficult. You know, I, what is it, about a year and a half, two years ago, I moved into the house and um, we always were trying to think of different ways to reach out to them. And just any time we did anything, it's just like we got a cold sh a shoulder and they just kind of, you know, were very distant from us. And then finally, um, what did we make? What was that first thing? Hasib, do you remember? What do we send to their house? Uh, a cake? Was it a cake or cupcakes? Anyways, so she's really good at making cupcakes. So she, she made some cupcakes or cake and we gave it to them. And then they're like, oh my God. And then, um, and then we exchanged numbers. Now we text each other once in a while. So it totally changed. And then one time, uh, I think we made pakoras or something like that, like samosas. And then we gave those to them, right? 
And this, now it's just becoming like this. And now he actually says hi to me, right? So, uh, which now is, nowadays it's something kind of odd, right? That we don't really even really say hi to each other. But maybe mowing their lawn, right? And, and I grew up in Michigan. We would go and shovel the neighbor's snow, right? The sidewalks. So um, different ways to kind of just break that ice and start, you know, that conversation. Okay, brothers, how about you guys, the classmates? Um, but really, like, if you invite, like, you're, you'll start out, like, really basic, like, you're inviting them out, maybe for a cup of tea, or to, like, study with you, and then you kind of, like, build up a rapport, mm -hmm. and then you kind of introduce the idea. Of, Excellent. Like, mm -hmm. And that, that word is really, really key, rapport. You have to build rapport with the person, some trust with that person before you go and start giving da'wah to them, right? Sometimes we think da'wah means I need to tell them all about Islam in one minute, the first minute I see them, and that's not the way it works, right? They're not going to, you know, you've probably read this or seen different examples, the, your, your inner circle or, you know, the circle of influence and things like that. So you, uh, if that person is not in your circle of influence, it's very unlikely that their person is going to listen to you, right? So you have to do, break the ice, build that rapport with them, and then you'll be able to slowly build that in, okay? So build that relationship, you know, go out for tea, talk about class, different things, and then eventually you can talk about, you know, Islam. Okay, uh, sisters in the back, you're strangers. This is extremely difficult. So strangers, you're on a plane ride and the person next to you, what would you do? Okay, so a simple smile, say hi. What else? <laughs> Any other ideas? Yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> well, so, so the reason why is um, a lot of times people don't want to, uh, especially about like religion and politics, right? So nobody wants to talk about those topics. And so you, right when you introduce that, people might get offended. Uh, yes, sister, and then Omar. Yeah. Amish or Mormons? Yeah, it's similar to Amish, but like, yeah. Okay. And so we just started talking about like the weather and the delay in the flight, and we were headed both to DC, Washington D.C., so we were talking about that and like mm -hmm. our trips, and then we started talking about religion from there. But you know, so like just kind of talking about your trip and something. That yeah. And then you'll start finding more and more things in common. And actually, so I had an interesting incident where um, I was, we were flying as a family, but I was sitting to the, next to this guy um, from Chicago or Phoenix. And we were flying from Chicago to Phoenix and then to Sacramento. And so this guy, uh, we're talking and then first he starts, um, I, I said, oh, so what brought you to Chicago? What, you know, what were you doing? And he said, oh, and he was so excited about this. So he was watching the Blackhawks game. This was some years ago in the Stanley Cup finals, um, a big hockey fan. And then, so we started talking about hockey. I don't know too much about hockey, even though I'm from Michigan and Detroit's supposed to be a huge team and everything, but I just never really got into it. But so he's, he's like, oh, you want to see some pictures? And so he's showing me all these different pictures and I'm, I'm just like, oh, that's cool. Okay, that's, uh, that's really nice. And then, and then one of the videos he showed me, he's like drunk, like, like him and his friend or brother, or whoever it was, extremely drunk. And so he's talking about it and he's like, ha ha, yeah, we were drunk. And, and, and then that's where I kind of came in and I said, well, I don't drink. And, and you know, now in our society, that's something extremely odd, right? So when someone says they don't drink, that's like, wait, what? What, what are you talking about? And so, so I said, yeah, well, I don't drink. And he said, well, how come? And I said, well, I'm Muslim. And as Muslims, we don't drink. And that's where I got him into talking about Islam. And so first we started talking about different foods. And I said, well, God has actually given us different commandments, uh, you know, throughout the Quran and, and the Prophet Sunnah and so on, that what to eat and what not to eat or what we're allowed to drink and not and so on. And so we follow God's command because he knows what's best for us. And so because of that, I followed along and I do that. And so we started discussing that more. I started talking to him about the masjid. I started talking to him about how we pray, explained all these different things. At the end, I don't want to say that he became Muslim, but basically I got him to say, uh, you could say the shahada, 
Okay, so basically I got him to say that there's only one God. Okay, he, he said, yeah, that's, there's no other God, right? There has to be one God. And I, uh, and I got him to say that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is probably a prophet <laughs> because of our conversation, right? So maybe he didn't fully believe in it, but he, he, he took that step. And then I gave him my number and everything. And so he wanted to actually go to a masjid when he landed or when he went home. And I gave him the Zabiha app, which was interesting because he was really into different foods. And he said, you know, how would I find like some really good restaurants? I said, well, we have this app. It's called Zabiha app. Maybe you could check those out and find some really cool restaurants. Okay. So anyway, so you have to come up with different ideas of how to, you could say, break the ice, start that conversation and go forward. What about coworkers? Yeah. Okay. Like, like in your workspace, whatever. Yeah. Like they are able to provide you space, and then maybe your coworker that you don't really talk to that much, or someone that goes past by, and then they just become a tree. Yeah. So I had these, uh, so uh, while I was working with the state, um, uh, <laughs> they thought I was having a seizure. So they almost call it, and then the, uh, my cube mate, he's like, no, no, he's praying. Like, then he just calmed everyone down. Because these people were passing by and they saw me, you know, going in Ruku and Sujood, and they thought I'm like having some kind of seizure. I'm, I don't know what was happening, you know. And so they started like running around like, oh my God, is Wasim okay? And, uh, and, and anyway, so then after the prayer, I actually went up to the lady and I, I talked to her and I said, well, we actually pray five times a day. But it was a, it was a way to start the conversation, right? Um, one of the things that Helping Hand did, they had these really nice um, um, calendars, right? And so I gave a lot of them to different people and they, they actually put them up in their cubicle. And so what, now they have the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? In Arabic, a really nice calligraphy and so on, and then the, the, the meaning of the name. And so now people pass by the cubicle and they're like, oh, okay, what, what does that mean? Or what language is that? And it's just a way to start the conversation. Especially at work, you're not really supposed to talk about religion, right? But it's a way to, you know, if they bring it, then it's fair game, right? So you can't be, you know, they brought it up. I, I had nothing to do with it. So one, one lady, um, this was some years back, but um, her grandmother died, I think, or someone close to her passed away. And um, I, I mentioned to her that, you know, one of the things that we do in some cultures, uh, Muslim cultures, is we recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And so uh, she's like, what's that? And uh, what's the Quran? And so she started asking questions. And then I recited it to her. And I told her what it meant. And then, um, and then I just went back. I, it took five to seven minutes. I went back to my cube and sat down, just, just kept working. She comes to me like half an hour, one hour, and she's crying. Okay? And she said, that, those are the, the most beautiful words I've ever heard. I want you to write it down for me. And so I did. I wrote it down for her. And I, I said, you know, this is what it is. It's uh, actually the opening chapter of the Quran. And so uh, just different methods to start the conversation. But the first thing is that you have to want it. You have to be looking for opportunities to actually have that conversation and uh, want to be motivated to tell them about Islam, inshallah. Okay, so Umar told me um, to talk about like an elevator pitch, pretty much, right? So you have like a minute or two minutes or whatever to tell someone about Islam, what would you talk about? So one of my teachers, they came up with OMG high, okay? So anyone have, if you have a really good blonde voice, OMG high or whatever, okay. I can't maybe do it, but anyways. So he came up with this and it's a really good acronym. And so you have the oneness of God or the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, alhamdulillah, so last Friday, it was interesting. And this was, I mentioned this maybe to someone else, but um, it, this is all tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this. How many of you guys know Abdurrahman from Sac State? Okay, he's the president of MSA there. Okay, so um, really nice guy, mashallah. So he was really after me. He was like, Wasim, you need to come. There's this um, MSA, Elk Grove. They're doing some kind of event um, for non-Muslims. You need to be there. And I'm like, okay, you know, what, what is it all about? He, he gave me some details, but I was kind of just delaying him. He kept bothering me and I kept delaying him. And then a few days before the event, I just decided, okay, I'm going to do it. I don't care. Whatever he's saying, I'll, I'll just come to it. So I came and, um, and the event was actually organized by this young sister. She's a senior in high school. 
And she organized this um, a day pretty much in order to have non-Muslims come and learn about Islam. And we had different, um, how many of you guys went to the spoken word of event at Sac State or, um, or Masjid al-Nur, anyone? So there was this brother Abu Bakr from Seattle, really awesome poet and a spoken word artist. Um, and so I, I myself was there, him, him, a few other sisters, uh, Sister Maheen from the state capital, I don't know if you know her. So different people were there and were giving different or explaining different topics about Islam. Now from that conversation and that, you know, I almost didn't go, about maybe 350, 400 some people learned about Islam, alhamdulillah, because of my being there, right? And actually that sister setting it up for us. And so one of the things that we need to do is that we need to always be looking for opportunities. We always need to be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for opportunities. How many of you guys are, when's the last time you asked a friend uh, or you asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the right opportunity to ask a friend and give them da'wah? Right? And so a lot of times we don't do that. How many times did we really, we want to give advice to a, a, a Muslim sister or a Muslim brother and we're thinking of different ways. How many, when's the last time we uh, made wudu and you know, really sincerely prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and then we go and try to give them advice, right? So these are some steps that we should take in, in order to really come closer to people um, and, and then give them the message. So anyways, I explained Islam in you could say five to seven minutes through using this method, okay? So oneness of God, Tawheed. So you focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, name, okay, that he is, uh, or la ilaha illallah itself, right? That there's no deity of worship, uh, worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can mention about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. You can mention how he's just. So the different attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you could focus on some of those things inshallah to begin the conversation. And then, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's being merciful and al-wudud, the one who loves us, the one who guides us, okay, the one who wants good for us, because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent messengers, and that's the next one, right? M. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent messengers to guide us, to guide mankind back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because without these messengers, we would have been misguided. <coughs> Excuse me. We wouldn't have known how to get back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so because of Allah's love for us, He sends us prophets and messengers throughout time to guide mankind back to Him. Guidance. So G, right? So guidance is the Quran itself, right? And different problems, or you could say societal problems that are occurring, try to give solutions or Quranic solutions or Islamic solutions to those problems. One of the things, um, my wife and I, alhamdulillah, we had the opportunity, we started the first women's shelter in Sacramento. Some of you guys might have heard about it. It's called Sakina Home. And alhamdulillah, I'm a board member of that organization as well. And so um, this, uh, one of the things that we've noticed is a lot of the sisters, a lot of the people moving into the home, they're, they're you know, foster children or they come from foster homes. And the amazing thing is that it's kind of like a recurring cycle that we're noticing, right? So it's like these, these people, mashallah, you know, they went through a very difficult time as they were growing up, maybe even adoption and so on, uh, foster homes. And then as they grow older, they start having kids and then their kids start going through the same process as well. And it's kind of like a, a really, really, I mean, I, I want to be politically correct, but it's like a very messed up situation. And it just it gets worse and worse, right? And the welfare system is getting worse and overburdened um, as well by these types of situations. So you have this type of thing going on, and so you try to give the Quranic solution. You give guidance from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this and how and offer solutions in this way. So you talk about the Quran because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. He sent messengers. <coughs> Those messengers, some of them brought books with them. And those books are kind of like a GPS uh, for us in our lives. They're some uh, a way to guide us and keep us guided on the path to Jannah, inshallah. And then you could talk about hereafter. Because of this life and because how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created 
mawt, basically death and life, in order to see who of you do the best good deeds, who does the best amal, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the almighty and ghafoor, the uh, uh, aziz ghafoor, the one who is off forgiving. And so because of this life being a test, every single thing that happens in our life is for a reason. And there's different challenges and obstacles that come in our life. And, we, and these are all tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get inshallah closer to Him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that tawfiq inshallah. And so you can talk about the hereafter. And you bring in the, you know, the day of judgment where everyone will be held accountable. All the different Syrian children that we see in the world that are suffering. All the different Muslims and non-Muslims and the different people who are being oppressed they will have that day where they will be able to get their right back on the Day of Judgment. And so you talk about the hereafter. And lastly, you can talk about invitation. And again, I don't, I'm not really pushy when it comes to this, but you can at least try to invite them. Just say, if you agree with these things, and maybe talk to, to them about the five pillars of Islam, and then say, if you agree with these things, then I would invite you to become Muslim. And it's really, really simple, actually. You just say these words, and you could say it in English actually first and then the Shahada in Arabic if they're willing to do that. And so, and that's not even really necessary. necessary. But the point is that you go through OMG high and you've been, you are able to explain Islam in a few minutes inshallah to your audience. Okay, does that make sense? Inshallah. Any questions about this? No? Okay. So again, kind of this cycle, so you have the linking object, word, attire, you have, you know, something that you, you, you kind of um, reach out to them. One of the brothers I would give da'wah with at the mall, we would go to the Arden Fair mall, we'd give da'wah and one of the, he, he just had a really good way of getting uh, people, I'm like a shy, the shy type, I'm like just standing, I'll tell you about Islam if you come to the table, right? And nobody's coming to the table, right? So this brother... He's just coming and saying, nice shirt. And he would just go, oh my God, that's an awesome shirt. Hey, come over here. And then it, you would just bring him to the table and then I would like do the, you know, the job from there. And so he had different ways of catching them. And then you know, I would explain it. So you have the linking object, the word, attire, whatever, something about them. You, you invite them to the table and then you build rapport. You, you start talking about the weather. You start talking about you know, maybe even uh, Sacramento or what they're doing, if they're college students, whatever it may be. You start building a, 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 a short relationship with them in that way. And then you have that conversation about Tawheed, okay, or the OMG high. And then you could uh, go back to you know, this again. And uh, again, at the mall, it depends on the situation, right? So like we do it at Denayos as well, sometimes the, the, what is it, the farmer's market, I guess. And so you might have a little bit more time there, but at the mall you have very few, uh, a few minutes. Some people do like to talk a little bit longer, but it depends. So it depends on what type of situation. If you're in a coffee shop with your friend and then you're talking to them about Islam, maybe you have half an hour to explain to them about the different uh, um, aspects about Islam. And so taking your time and giving the message, inshallah, in that way. Okay. What time is it? Let's just shut off. 9.13. Okay. I want to finish by 9.30. Is that okay with everyone, inshallah? And then maybe a few minutes for Q&A if, if we need that. So uh, you can maybe do it the same groups or if you want to switch it up a little bit. What I'd like you to do, actually, let's do this. Just do it one-on-one. -on -one. So whoever is next to you, I would like you to explain OMG high to them uh, in a few minutes. Okay. So you have two minutes. So one person tries it on that person and then that person tries it on the other. Okay? How about that? Sounds good? So who remembers? O for what? One God, or oneness, Tawheed. M? Messenger. G? Guidance, Quran. Okay? Scripture, so on. H? Hereafter. I? Invitation. Okay? So go ahead. You have, let's give you guys three minutes to do this. So talk to one another really quickly, inshallah. Did you just smack her? No, I just, I heard something, but. So go ahead, three minutes, inshallah. Okay, what stands, uh, stands out about the conversation that you guys were just having? Anything that, some really like, you know, you had this moment and like, oh my God, that's an amazing, I'm gonna use that tip. Anyone? Yeah. Take it from through like each step from 
pose at the key waves to I. Like, there certainly need to be explained in order for each step to make sense. So that might that adds a little bit of complexity to the, uh, to the uh, conversation. That, that's true. I mean, uh, there are some, like you're about to hear after, it's, a, it's, it's so different than maybe what other religions um, believe in the hereafter or how they believe in it. So it's sometimes difficult on how to convey it, and especially if you have a very limited amount of time. Um, and it's not necessary for you to go through all five of these, but uh, as much as you can, you know, and, and whatever time you have, you can go through that, inshallah. But any from this conversation that you just had with um, your partner, what is something that st stood out from that conversation? Anyone had something like really interesting that they said? That stood, yeah. Maybe someone who read a lot about it, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily know someone who's kind of like lived and practiced, right? So if you can explain something from your side that they can understand. That's a really good one. So like ask them actually questions, right? And, and uh, have them kind of tell you their understanding about Islam, right? And then maybe you could kind of verify that or not for them. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that right in the beginning of the conversation, you should kind of try to get an idea. Like, are they a Jew? Are they, you know, Christian, Hindu? Uh, because you might be telling them, uh, well, we have scripture and we have this and that, and then you find out they're an atheist and they don't believe in any of those things. So you want to start off with something like that and then build into that conversation uh, of what you're explaining to them. That's a good point, mashallah. Okay, so... Um, the next thing over here, and, and so uh, you're going to need to do a little bit more practice of it. Um, I'd like to invite all of you guys to do this. So uh, we have this, uh, uh, everyone probably has heard of the California State Fair, right? This is a annual event. It's like two to three weeks um, uh, in the Arden Fair area and so on, um, or the Cal Expo area. So for about two weeks straight, 15 days, uh, we usually have a booth set up for giving da'wah to non-Muslims. We have Qur'ans, pamphlets, CDs, all these different items to give away uh, for free and telling them, tell them about Islam. Um, and we usually need volunteers. So I really encourage everyone to do that. And, you know, and maybe before that we could have like more of these types of sessions where you could have more mock dialogue and kind of learn about how to do it and and, and, and maybe go to the mall or something like that. How many of you guys have been to the mall or somewhere giving da'wah? One? Anyone else? Or uh, maybe a booth at the student council or somewhere yeah, you have? Okay, on campus you do it? And it's just like a booth with different materials and you... Okay. Okay, Masha. So many of you guys have experience with that already. So those types of, um, you know, and, and I, I try to invite everyone. I know it's usually the same people giving that one over and over again, right? You see the same people that are interested, but just everyone should try to, you know, pitch in and do uh, volunteer once in a while in order to, for, your, for you to get your feet wet as well, inshallah. Okay, so why Islam? Um, basically, why is Islam correct? Um, and I don't want to go into details. I have eight minutes. I want to finish by 9.30, inshallah. But there's this video by um, uh, Baba Ali. How many of you guys have heard of him? Okay. He did this. Uh, he's usually doing like jokes and all these different things. He actually made a very serious video. It's called Why Islam? Uh, I really suggest you watch that. It's about seven or eight minutes long. And he gives a really beautiful explanation or introduction to Islam in those seven minutes. Um, and why Islam is, you could say, the religion of choice or the one that we should be following. And so watching something like that, watching different scholars of how they explain, that can really, really help. Other things, like I have this long list of things, but you can mention some of these points that the confirmation of the past messages. One of the things that I always tell people to try to get them to understand or help them understand um, the Qur'an is that it's the final testament, right? You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament, and so on. 
but the Quran is the final testament. It's the final word of God, and it's a guidance for mankind. So uh, something that you can mention about this. You could also talk about how Islam actually, and this is one thing that uh, most non-Muslims won't understand, but you could talk about how every uh, prophet was actually a Muslim. Because a lot of people will say, well, no, well, Abraham was a Jew or you know, Moses was actually a Jew or Jesus was a Christian and so on and whatnot. But I, I try to tell them and I, I, take, I tell them to take a step back and I said, from Adam alayhi salam actually till the last prophet, all of the prophets are Muslims. And they're like, well, how come? How can that be? Because Islam or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi brought Islam. So that doesn't make sense. And I said, well, no, actually Islam, what does Islam mean? What? Submission to what? Like a submission whole Khabib holds? Submitting to God. Okay? And by submitting to God, you um, are surrendering, surrendering yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments. You find peace in, in that. And so all of the prophets, they were Muslims in, in the sense that they all submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's kind of like an interesting point for them. And they, they understand as, uh, the word Islam or Muslims a little bit better uh, from that. You could talk about salvation from hellfire because uh, for Muslims, okay? But one of the th uh, concepts that is interesting to them is that we don't have full hope or full, um, like 100% guarantee that we're going to Jannah, right? And one of the, there was this one missionary that she came to one of the booths or tables at one time. And we were having this conversation and I said, well, I don't know I'm going to paradise. And she goes, well, what do you mean? I'm guaranteed paradise. I'm like, I'm a reborn or a born again Christian or whatever. So I'm going to, you know, Jannah or paradise for sure. I said, well, we, as Muslims, we have a hope that we're going to go to Jannah. We have a hope that our good deeds are accepted and that God is pleased with us and so on. And we earn God's pleasure in this world and then He's, you know, gives us Jannah for a reward afterwards. But I can't, you know, guarantee that for myself. And so that was something that took her aback and she just, you know, she was kind of shocked by that. Because that, that humbles you, right? And a lot of times you find people who are following some of the other faiths, uh, they become really, really self-righteous again and thinking that they're going to Jannah or um, uh, uh, Paradise and everyone else is going to hell. One of the, uh, it was disgusting. So there is this one Christian group, they were standing outside the state fair, uh, the Cal Expo area, and they had these little um, like pamphlets, okay? Um, uh, and actually pictures. So they had these little pictures with like uh, dead babies, like uh, babies, you know, that uh, uh, the mother had an abortion and so on. and. Pretty much they were going to people and they're like, did you see this? This is what you're doing to your children? That person's going to hell. And so it was, and everyone was like just disgusted by it. And they're like, just get away from me, right? And so th this, is, this type of attitude and going into thinking that I'm going to Jannah and everyone else Billah, is going to hell or something like this. This is of course not the attitude of a Muslim. And that's one of the reasons what sets Islam apart from others. Even though of course we have the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our good deeds and lets us into Jannah. And so uh, the social problems, I mentioned that before, are free of doubt and contradictions. You could talk about the Quran as well, uh, how it's timeless, um, it's for all um, human beings and uh, for all people and so on. Okay. Um, you have atheists. Okay. There's a very, very good video um, by Yasser Qadi. Okay. So it's six to seven minutes, it's, a, it's a, just a short video about um, atheism or how to talk to atheists. Uh, that's one I, I could suggest or I would suggest. Um, there's so many different things that you can mention to atheists. They really don't have a, a strong argument. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of, you could say, the, their flimsy argument, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only dedicated two verses in the entire Quran for them, for, an, for atheists. And so the, from Surah um, At-Tur, ayah number 35 and 36, he says, min ghayri am hum, That were they created by nothing or were they the creators of themselves? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them basically, you either come, uh, you cre were created from nothing, which a lot of people say nowadays, or you created yourself, which is not possible, 
Okay? And then the next ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am khalaqu samawati wal ard bal la yuqinun. Or did they create the heavens and the earth? And then rather they are not certain. They don't have any yaqeen in this. They don't really know or have an idea of what they're talking about. Right? So really there's only, you could say three possibilities, which is that um, one, it was this universe and everything was created by nothing at all. Okay, which doesn't really make sense. Like for example, and this is a very simplistic argument, but if someone said that to you, that this hall or this you know, room was completely empty, <coughs> and all of a sudden there was this loud explosion or something happened, and all these chairs became arranged, and this wood, you know, all this different thing hap- uh, happened. Um, there's paint all over the walls. This projector came into its place. This happened. Everything just came by its own or on its own. Would you believe that? Would that make any sense to you? Would it? No, right? Why? Because it's, it's something in a very materialistic world, even the most simple things, there, there has to be a cause to it, or you know, there has to be something that made this happen. And so there's actually two things really quickly I'll, I'll mention. One's called a watchmaker theory. How, how many of you guys have heard of that before? Some, some people are shaking their heads. A few, okay. So what's the watch, watchmaker theory? If there is something that you find, where? Okay, so if there's something uh, in, intelligent in design, then that m- m- must mean that there is a, a designer behind it, right? So if you find like a phone, in the middle of the desert or in the classroom or anywhere, you automatically know that it came from somewhere, right? Someone must have dropped it, someone or whatever, and then it was manufactured and so on. Nobody's going to say, well, again, the sand, the silicone and all this silicon, all these different things came together. They made this, you know, phone and that's what we have in front of us right now, right? Nobody's going to trust that. So it's called the watchmaker theory. Very simplistic argument. Another one is called Pascal's wager. And so Hasib actually used this with one of his friends in school. So uh, Pascal's Wager, how many of you guys have heard of that? Some of you guys. Okay. So it's a, quite simple. It's really logical where if a person, there's really two options, right? So a person who believes in God and who, one who doesn't, right? So the person who believes in God, if they live their life in this way, they die and there's no God. A'udhu Billah. Right? And they die but there's no God. Are they going to be punished? There's no God, there's no hereafter, there's nothing afterwards. They're just dead. Is anything going to happen to them? No, right? They're just, they, they believed in God, they, right, they you know, serve God throughout their life, but afterwards, if there's not, nothing, then they don't lose at all. But the other person, let's just say, for example, they live their life as a, an atheist, okay, or agnostic or whatever, they didn't really believe in any God or any religion, they didn't practice, they just followed their desires. They live their entire life when they die and if there is a God, they're in big trouble, right? So it just makes logical sense, right? Then that's why it's called Pascal's Wager. It just makes more sense to follow a religion, follow a deen to, uh, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, those are just examples to use with a non-Muslim. But inshallah, we have yaqeen that there is, of course, a creator. There is Jannah and Jahannam. And we, we are going to be held accountable on, on the Day of Judgment for the actions that we do in this life. Okay? So th- there's different things um, that you can use. There's uh, Hamza, I think he visited Davis maybe uh, last year or so. Hamza, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Zor- Zordis or Tordis. Uh, I can't remember how to or say it, but so you can look him up on, uh, he has a lot of different videos about, especially about atheism. If you have a friend who's kind of thinking about different things and needs some help. One thing, even taking a step back, why do you think people become atheists? Usually. Yeah. Yeah. So usually something, either they see it in the world around them. And they can't just have they're like, why is God doing this? A'udhu Billah, he must be, you know, a merciless God or something like this. Or something really bad happens to them, right? And there, a certain trauma happens to them. It causes them to, you know, have doubt and, 
you know, and start thinking about those types of things. So again, you have to try to think of different ways of, remember that this life is a test. We're going through all sorts of different problems. My tests are much different than your tests, okay? And every single person has a different test paper in front of them, and we're going to be held accountable for those things. Um, Quran, the guidance of mankind, and this is the last slide, inshallah. So what are some things that we could use really quickly? Um, what are some things that you would say? Why would the Quran be something that, you know, that makes sense that it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. There is no contradiction. Okay, there's no contradiction in the Quran. So that's one thing you could use, right? But again, you're talking to a non-Muslim, they're not going to believe that. But that's one thing you could mention that maybe you could read it for yourself. Let's see if you find any contradictions per se. What else? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. So there's different uh, miracles that were or foretold in the Quran about the womb, you know, and the, the, the baby and, and the different, um, what is it, the embryonic cycles and all these different things. Embryology mentioned 1400 years ago, which is not possible. Um, so all these different miracles you could say that are mentioned in the Quran that it was scientifically impossible for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to know something like that 1400 years ago, right? And so all these different evidences you can use from that, you can use the, the fact that millions of people have memorized the Quran, that's a fact, right? Is there any other book that has any, anyone even close to that? That millions of people have memorized that book, especially of that size, 600 pages? So no, right? So that's, that's a miracle in itself. By reciting the Quran, that's probably one of the best ways to tell. Just you recite it to them. They, I've done that, alhamdulillah, at the booth a few times. I said, Can you, if you have a few minutes, I'd just like to recite a few verses. I recite the Quran to them, and they're just, they just stare at you. And it's not because I have a good voice or anything like that. They just like look at you, and they're like, can you repeat that? What is that? And I said, that's the Quran, that's the Arabic word, and it just, it has an impact on people. And so even though they don't understand it, they're non-Muslims, right? They're not Arabs or anything, so, but they, they have, it touches them in a certain way. It gives them peace, and one of the things that a lot of people started becoming Muslim uh, through those things is we start giving different CDs which tra with translation, and people would listen to it, then ask more questions, and eventually even become Muslim from those types of things. So, yes? I think it would be fine. Uh, the only thing, I mean, of course, uh, you want to be a little bit, uh, or you want to be modest in the way you recite, right? Um, but I don't think there's any problem with that. Yeah, there's nothing. Okay, so the Quran, you could use different things um, that many people have memorized it. Uh, kids five, six years old, memorize the entire Quran. Grandmothers 80, 90 years old have memorized the entire Quran at that age. So this is a miracle by itself. Uh, it's preserved in its original language. So all these different things that you could mention, that's the only scripture that, I mean, there's no other scripture that has, we have the original version of it. And then we have thousands and, or millions of people who have chains of, um, you could say, reciters, who it goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? So we have all these different, you could say, methods of saying that this is the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we should use that. And I said I, uh, I was going to stop at 9.30. I went a little bit over. Just want to end with this, inshallah, that whatever we heard, da'wah is a verb. Okay? Da'wah is something that you want to do. It's, some, it's an actionable item. I want you to think of that really sincerely, that tomorrow in the morning, wake up and think about who are you going to give da'wah to. Who are you going to be able to call to Islam in a way, you know, maybe it's a best friend of yours, someone, uh, a family. It could be um, a, a someone who's Muslim who's not really practicing. There's a lot of people struggling with, the, with their faith. And so you invite them, maybe start inviting them to the masjid or, or to one salah or something like this. Whatever it could be, something simple, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and understanding and let us do this, inshallah, as um, the best as possible. Uh, I'm going to send Omar a link for um, the Elmscape and uh, Ikna volunteer group if you want to be a part of that. Uh, we don't send too many messages, I think, inshallah, hopefully, maybe four or five messages a week. Um, and uh, I'll share that with you guys. Um, and there's a basketball tournament if any of you guys are interested. It's on March 21st. Sorry, that's cut off, I think, unless it's there.
Okay, so, um, and then the camping trip I told you about on April 11th and 12th. Jazakum Allah khairan. If there's any questions, quickly we'll take them and then we'll finish, inshallah. No questions? Either you're really, really confused or I did a really good job in explaining or you just want to go home. I don't know. It's one of the three. If there's no questions, inshallah, jazakum Allah khairan. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you guys. Uh, it's, it's a weeknight. <laughs> it's almost 10 o'clock by the time you get home. Uh, it's going to be extremely late. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, really reward you guys and uh, uh, for coming out, uh, listening to this. And the, again, that was a verb. Practice it. Okay, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the tawfiq to do what I uh, practice what I said and also all of us to be ambassadors uh, ambassadors of Islam to the people around us inshallah. Jazakum khair.